I'm Jane Byford. I'm a partner and head of higher education at VWV. And with me today is Bob Fay, who is a partner, and Casey Hurst is, is an associate. So we can move on to the next slide, please, which is our agenda. And I'll just give you a brief rundown of what we're going to do today. So first of all, Katie's going to look at what a protected conversation is and what claims are covered by the protected conversation regime. I'll then look at the interaction between uh, protected conversations and without prejudice discussions. I'll look at the protected conversation process and I'll go through some of the potential pitfalls. We'll then move on to Bob who will look at settlement agreements and provide some practical guidance for you. And there should be plenty of time at the end to answer your questions. So I'll hand you over to Katie. Thank you, Jane. Um, so as Jane mentioned, what I'm going to talk about to start with um, is what is a protected conversation and when you might want to use one. So what is a protected conversation um, and why might you want to use it? So an employer might want to propose termination of employment on mutually agreed terms before there is any dispute between the parties. And that could be for a variety of reasons. So for example, um, shortcomings in the employee's performance, organizational changes, so planned redundancies, for example, or sometimes um, just a clash of personalities um, is, is quite a common scenario that crops up. Um, so from an employer's perspective, it's commercially beneficial often at an early stage to have that conversation with an employee without having to go through a capability process or a redundancy process or disciplinary proceedings. So a protected conversation is different to a without prejudice conversation. Um, and Jane will talk about without prejudice conversations in more detail. Um, but the the, the general premise is that an employer can have an open conversation, sorry, an, an honest conversation with an employee about terminating their employment on mutually agreed terms with a view to that conversation then not being used in litigation at a later stage. Traditionally, employers were quite cautious about having conversations with employees before any dispute had arisen because often there was a risk in those situations of um, a constructive dismissal claim potentially arising if the employee felt that actually being approached with a view to their employment being terminated um, was a, a breach of the implied term of trust and confidence. Um, also, employers were slightly nervous about it because employees might say that such conversations amounted to discrimination or victimization, or sometimes if the employee had um, raised a whistleblowing complaint, that then being approached about termination was potentially a detriment. Um, so historically, employers were in a bit of a, a difficult situation when trying to resolve things commercially. And it was really in response to that that um, back in July 2013, the government introduced a new statutory framework. The, the statutory term for it is pre-termination negotiations, um, which is essentially the same as a protected conversation. So those, those two are the same thing. Um, the aim of the, the, I won't say it's the new statutory regime, but the aim of the statutory regime was that it would be easier for employers to initiate those conversations with less risk of them being admissible in subsequent tribunal proceedings. Um, however, as we'll see when we look into it in a bit more detail, in fact, there are quite significant limitations to when they can be used. Um, although they, they can be a useful tool. So what is a pre-termination negotiation? Um, the statute defines it as any offer made or discussions held before the termination of the employment in question with a view to it being terminated on terms agreed between employer and employee. Um, one thing I would say at this point is that there is case law that suggests that 
um, a, a conversation won't amount to a protected conversation if no settlement offer is actually made to the employee. Um, so there was a um, case, an employment tribunal decision which um, involved a CEO of a company. Um, he was sat down by the chairman and asked whether he considered resigning from his employment. He said he hasn't. And essentially the chairman then said that he wanted to end his employment and that he'd no longer have a job by the following week. The tribunal perhaps unsurprisingly found that that was not um, a protected conversation because no settlement offer was actually made to the employee. Um, and there weren't any negotiations with a view to the employment being terminated on mutually agreed terms. Um, so moving on to the next slide, I'm just going to talk about which claims um, are applicable in the sense of protected conversations. So the basic position is that those conversations are inadmissible in respect of ordinary unfair dismissal claims. And you'll see on the slide, it says, unless there is improper behavior, which I'll come on to in a moment. So this is one of the, um, the biggest limitations really of the um, protected conversation regime is that it's only in respect of unfair dismissal claims that they cannot be referred to. Um, if the conversations are protected, then what it means is that the fact the conversation has taken place, as well as what was discussed during the conversation, are both not to be um, disclosed in tribunal proceedings. So it's only ordinary unfair dismissal claims that are um, applicable. Um, so it doesn't include any automatically unfair dismissal claim. So for example, where somebody has made a protected disclosure um, and then alleged that they've been dismissed on the basis that they made that disclosure. Um, or more recently in the context of COVID, we've seen automatic unfair dismissal claims where people are claiming that they've been dismissed for having raised health and safety concerns. So there would be no protection in those types of claims. Um, it also doesn't apply in respect of discrimination, um, whistleblowing, which is uh, mentioned on the slide, and also wrongful dismissal, so a claim for notice pay. Um, that, that makes it quite difficult for employers because um, it's not very often that people bring claims just for ordinary unfair dismissal. It will often be unfair dismissal and some other type of claim as well. Um, creates a slightly difficult situation in practice because what it means in the employment tribunal is that the conversation would not be admissible in respect of the unfair dismissal claim, but would be admissible in respect of the other types of claim. Um, so it can create some practical difficulty. Um, of course, the, the other thing is employers won't know what potential claims employees might bring in the employment tribunal. And it ultimately comes down to how the claim is drafted. Um, so even if it's drafted um, in terms that don't seem to be legitimate, so that the claim itself doesn't seem to be very strong. If it is a claim for something other than ordinary unfair dismissal, then those conversations will be able to be referred to. Um, so again, there is some in inherent uncertainty with, with having the conversations. I'm just gonna talk in a bit more detail about what attracts statutory protection. Um, so there is an ACAS code on settlement agreements, um, the ACAS code of practice, which focuses on the admissibility provisions regarding um, protected conversations. Um, the failure to follow the code itself doesn't give rise to a claim. 
But if a claim is bought, then the employment tribunal can take the code and will take the code into account. That's only likely to crop up in a context where an employee is actually alleging that there has been improper behaviour um, and therefore is alleging that the conversation should be referred to as part of their claim. So the ACAS code sets out a number of things that employers should do um, and should think about when having these conversations with employees. So the first thing to mention is that employees should be given a reasonable period of time to consider the settlement proposal. And there's reference to 10 calendar days in the ACAS code. Um, and, and when we say time to consider the settlement proposal, it's generally understood that that is 10 calendar days to consider both an offer of settlement, if there is one, and also the written terms of potential settlement. So the settlement agreement itself. There's been some speculation, I think, over the years as to whether those 10 calendar days restart if a counteroffer is made. There, there's no um, straightforward answer to that. It's a question of what's reasonable in the circumstances. So what's a reasonable amount of time for the employee to be given? The general view seems to be that if within those 10 days there is a counter offer in terms of the monetary settlement, that that in itself won't generally trigger the 10 days to consider again. Um, but if there were significant changes proposed to the settlement terms themselves, that might well be an appropriate time to restart the clock and give the employee 10 days to consider the offer. Um, the other thing that's mentioned in the code, which is potentially slightly problematic, um, is allowing employees to be accompanied at these conversations. That doesn't really take account of the fact that these are often um, impromptu conversations that don't involve um, formal invites, etc. But employers should be mindful that there is that provision within the code to allow employees to be accompanied during the conversation. I don't think there's any clear case law on what would happen if an employee wanted to have a companion and that was refused. Um, the main risk would seem to be around employees alleging that they were put under undue pressure to accept the agreement and that essentially that undue pressure amounted to improper behaviour and the statutory protection falls away in respect of the unfair dismissal claim. So what is improper behaviour? Um, the ACAS code sets out a number of specific examples of what improper behaviour is um, and also some examples of what would not be considered to be improper behaviour. Um, just to say in terms of the tribunal process um, that what the tribunal are looking at would be looking at if there was an allegation of improper behaviour would firstly be making a finding on whether there had been something said or done which amounted to improper behaviour and then if it found that there was it would then go on to consider to what extent it's just an equitable for that to affect the admissibility of the conversation. So what that means is, even if improper behaviour is found to have occurred, that doesn't automatically mean that all of the um, details of the protected conversation are then admissible. It's a question of the tribunal considering what's just and equitable in the circumstances. So to give you some of the examples from the ACAS code um, of what improper behaviour is, so there are the obvious ones, so harassment, bullying, intimidation, um, offensive words, aggressive behaviour, physical assault, obviously, victimisation and discrimination on the grounds of one of the protected characteristics. 
so age, sex, race, disability, and so on. Um, the slightly less obvious ones are what's referred to as undue pressure. So what might undue pressure be? So the examples given are that the employee is not given a reasonable time to consider the settlement offer. So again, just focusing on that 10 calendar days. Um, secondly, the employer saying that the employee will be dismissed if they don't accept the offer. So again, before there's been any disciplinary process, if the employer has this conversation with the employee and says, if you don't accept this offer, you'll be dismissed, that's And thirdly, on the flip, it can go both ways. There can be improper behavior on the employee side. Um, just to finally mention the examples in the code which show that behavior is to, sorry, to show which behavior is unlikely to be improper. So two examples are giving. So setting out in a neutral manner, the reasons that have led to the proposed settlement agreement. So that might be the performance concerns or the personality clash or the fact that there are um, upcoming organizational changes, for example. And the second example of something which would not be improper behavior is factually stating the alternatives if agreement cannot be reached. Um, so that could include the possibility of disciplinary action. So it is okay for an employer to set out what the alternative is if an agreement can't be reached, but obviously we wouldn't want um, the university to give the impression that there was predetermined decision in terms of disciplinary action or redundancy, for example. So that brings me to the end of my section on protected conversations. Um, I know we've got a few questions in the chat, which I think we'll come to at the end. And um, so I'll hand over to Jane. Thank you, Casey. So on to the next slide, please. And I'm going to look at the interaction between protected conversations and without prejudice discussions. Um, and protected conversations haven't replaced without prejudice discussions. Indeed, uh, a, a conversation can be a protected conversation and a without prejudice discussion. Um, so without prejudice discussions are something that aren't just in the employment um, law context. They're in relation um, to all kinds of disputes. And the idea is it's a matter of public policy to encourage parties to settle disputes out of court. So the, it's a common law principle and it prevents statements, whether they're all or in writing, uh, which are made in a genuine attempt to settle an existing dispute from being put before a court or tribunal as evidence in legal proceedings between the parties to that dispute. So the idea is that parties can speak freely in negotiations without fear that anything said can be used in evidence against them if negotiations break down. And as I've said, these kind of um, conversations um, uh, had in all kinds of situations, and this predates the, the protected conversation um, uh, legislation. So this principle applies, as I said, to all kinds of um, claims, and particularly in the employment context, it's not just limited to unfair dismissal claims. It can include discussions, um, uh, without prejudice discussions about breach of contract claims, unlawful discrimination claims, whistleblowing claims, Anything, uh, any kind of em employment claim or indeed other claims can be the subject matter of a, a, a without prejudice conversation. And the, so the without prejudice conversation is potentially much wider uh, than the protected conversations, which are only gonna help you in relation to an ordinary unfair dismissal claim. The key though is that protected conversations can happen much earlier on. In relation to without prejudice conversations, Without prejudice discussions can only take place if there's a dispute. So there has to be an ongoing dispute. Now, in employment context, that could be something like disciplinary proceedings, a performance management process, or a redundancy process. We'd always recommend, though, that that process is started so there's clearly a dispute uh, before you start having without prejudice discussions. Slightly different scenario in relation to grievances. 
grievances aren't necessarily going to amount to a dispute. And that was the case in the case of BMP and uh, Paribas and Mexotero. And there a woman raised a grievance about being prevented to return to her old job after the end of her maternity leave. And um, she was then called to a meeting and that meeting, which was said to be without prejudice, um, she was told that her job was no longer viable, uh, that it would be best for both parties if she left under a settlement agreement, and that if she didn't, she was going to be made redundant. Well, in that situation, um, what the uh, tribunal said was that this wasn't a dispute. She was just questioning why she wasn't allowed to come back to her job. So there wasn't a dispute that had protection. Um, and uh, therefore it wasn't covered by the without prejudice uh, rule. And she was allowed to bring um, details of that so-called without prejudice conversation um, into evidence in a later uh, discrimination claim. So I think in the area of grievances, you have to be um, slightly careful. As well as there being an ongoing uh, dispute, there has to be a genuine attempt to settle that dispute. So that's what the negotiations, the discussions should be about. And put that in the um, HE context. So there's a case of Hudson and Oxford University. And there an employee had been dismissed and was appealing against the decision to dismiss them and was suspended pending that appeal. And in the case that the registrar wrote to that employee under the heading of a without prejudice letter saying, there is no prospect of you returning to work for this university in any capacity. It would clearly be desirable to find a solution. However, this is not and will not be possible until and unless you accept the resumption of employment, the employment relationship is both unrealistic and unworkable. And in that case, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, rather unsurprisingly really, said that this wasn't an attempt to, to settle a, a, an ongoing um, dispute at all. Uh, it wasn't a genuine attempt to settle it. This was a threat that if the employee um, didn't enter into a settlement agreement, um, that um, uh, they would um, be dismissed. It was clear that they were saying um, this um, the employment was going to come to an end, whatever happened. So again, it wasn't a without prejudice discussion and it could be used in subsequent proceedings. So I think the lesson to be learned is be careful. You do need to have an ongoing dispute and the discussions do need to be a genuine attempt to settle that um, dispute. And there are some very narrow exceptions to the without prejudice principle where it might be that you can challenge something being on a without prejudice basis, uh, despite the fact that there is an ongoing dispute and is a genuine attempt to settle that dispute. So. Uh, Katie talked about in, um, protected conversations, things like undue influence and, and, it's, and not giving people enough time to consider uh, and so on might be uh, relevant. Well, there are very narrow exceptions in relation to the without prejudice rule. So really something like misrepresentation, fraud or unambiguous impropriety are the reasons why a court might look and say, no, that's not without prejudice generally. So you've got a bit more leeway there. But um, you have to um, bear in mind that this does only apply in relation to um, where there is a dispute. So protected conversations, although um, you have to be much more careful about what you say in a protected conversation than without prejudice discussion, they can be had much earlier on. There has to be a dispute in relation to a without prejudice discussion. Move on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to look now at the process for a protected conversation. Katie's touched on this, um, uh, particularly um, in relation to improper conduct. But there's no set process for what a protected conversation, um, how a protected conversation takes place. Um, the guidance uh, envisages a meeting or a series of meetings and setting out an offer um, in writing. But it's really um, up to you as to how you conduct a protected conversation. But we'd recommend following um, this process. We'd say have an initial meeting um, with the employee to explain the proposal and see if they're interested in it. Um, in most cases, as Katie said, these are sort of impromptu, dis informal discussions. So you probably won't be notifying the employee um, of the purpose of the meeting and what's going to be discussed at it beforehand. Um, but um, and it probably will just be um, uh, 
sort of a, a sp not the spur of the moment, but an employee will just be called into a meeting rather than be given formal notification of it. So as Katie say, it could be difficult to um, have the right to be accompanied at that meeting, but we'd say that that is quite um, normal. If someone asks to be accompanied, then certainly um, the meeting should be adjourned to allow them to be. Ideally, you'd have a note taker present just in case um, there are any accusations at a later state stage of improper conduct so you've got a note uh, to rebut that um, but what you should say at the start of the conversation you don't necessarily need to say it's a protected conversation I know that's a question that's been asked but you should say it's confidential and you should say it won't be admissible in any subsequent legal proceedings those are the, the things you should be um, saying you don't need to use the words um, the magic words protected conversation or pre-contract negotiations just to say it's confidential and that it won't be admissible in subsequent proceedings. You should explain to the employee the circumstances that are leading to the meeting um, in a neutral manner. So the kind of thing you might be saying is, look, concerns have been raised about your performance. No decision has been made yet about whether to take you through the performance procedure. But we wondered whether it was worth having an initial chat to see if um, some agreement can be reached between the parties. Or in a case of gross misconduct, again, there'd be some allegations made against you. Um, we're considering whether or not to, to investigate those under the disciplinary procedure. Uh, nothing has been predetermined, uh, but we wondered whether a discussion with you at this stage um, and see whether we could find um, some uh, a mutually agreed exit would be um, a way forward. But no pressure should be put on the uh, employee in relation to that. And you should use as neutral tones um, as possible. If the employee does um, express an interest in the terms proposed, then suggest that set out in a follow-up letter. So it's very clear to the employee, and it might be that that follow-up letter also uh, contains a draft settlement agreement, if that's your, you think that's the appropriate way forward. But set it out clearly in a letter so that the employee can go and uh, take advice and give that the employee a reasonable time frame. Katie's mentioned that the ACAS guidance says 10 days, but you may agree a shorter period. Um, and if you do so, I do that in, in, in writing. Sometimes an employee just wants to get through this process and sign up to a settlement agreement as quickly as possible. And, and, and that can be the case, uh, but if they need more time, then that 10 days is, is the ideal under um, the ACAS um, guidance. Then I would suggest offering them the opportunity of, of a further meeting. And that meeting they would be formally invited to and they would formally set out their right to be accompanied by a workplace colleague or trade union representative. So that's really when that kicks in. That's when you're perhaps discussing the details uh, of what the settlement um, would look like and what's been put in writing to them. It's quite important that they are accompanied at that stage uh, by a workplace colleague or trade union representative. And that's what the ACAS um, guidance um, envisages. So that's the process we'd suggest adopting. If we move on to the next slide, I'll highlight some of the um, pitfalls. As I've said, um, the circumstances leading to the meeting should be explained to the employee, but use that neutral tone. Um, you want to make sure that they are reassured um, that this is an offer to be considered and that nothing has been determined. So if you talk about disciplinary process, in no way should you be saying, um, you know, we think this is going to end in a dismissal for gross misconduct or something like that. You can say you may need to be taken through the um, disciplinary procedure. Um, it'll be need to be investigated, that kind of thing, but as neutral um, as possible. And no ultimatums um, should be given. Um, you shouldn't be saying, saying you agree to this, or we take you down the disciplinary route, or you will be dismissed, um, or something like that. Um, I think it's also important that you consider before you have that um, protected conversation, that you consider whether there may be discrimination or whistleblowing or other angles that come in. Has the employee got a protected characteristic? Could they allege that um, they are being discriminated against by uh, conduct prior to or during um, this protected conversation. It's something to bear in mind um, because, as Katie has said, if uh, this does go to tribunal, ordinary unfair dismissal, it, it, it will be disregarded, this conversation, if it's done correctly. But as far as a discrimination claim or a whistleblowing claim, it can be taken into consideration. So think about that up front. And often that is a case where 
you might not want to have a protected conversation at an early stage, and you might want to wait until there's a dispute so you can have a without prejudice conversation, uh, which covers discrimination and whistleblowing too. So I think um, there are circumstances where uh, it will be a protected conversation and a without prejudice discussion as well. But in some circumstances, you want to be careful about when you have that protected conversation that protects against ordinary unfair dismissal claims, and when you might want to wait a bit longer until there's a dispute and attempt to settle that with a without prejudice discussion. I hand you over to Bob. Thanks, Jen. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, I'm now going to deal with what happens when your uh, without prejudice or protected conversation has gone well and the employee is open to uh, leaving under agreed terms um, when those terms are recorded in a settlement agreement. Um, as you'll probably know, a settlement agreement is a legally binding contract uh, which can operate to waive the claims an employee may bring arising from their employment or its termination. Uh, if compliant, the agreement will waive most uh, statutory and non-statutory employment claims. So uh, what claims can be settled? There are certain claims that cannot be waived in settlement agreements. Uh, and these include claims for uh, failure to inform and consult in TUPI or collective redundancy consultation situations. Although it is possible to waive an employee's claim for failure to pay a protective award if the collective redundancy uh, obligation is breached. So a, a slightly odd situation where they can't actually give up the right to bring the um, claim for compensation or claim for breach, but they can give up the right to claim for compensation. Uh, also, there are certain other uh, individual exceptions that include things like uh, rights relating to agency workers, um, the blacklisting regulations, uh, zero hours contracts, um, and in relation to uh, any failure to pay the various types of uh, statutory parental pay, such as maternity pay or paternity pay. Um, in relation to most of those claims, there is an alternative open to you, which is going through uh, an ACAS conciliation process where a waiver is obtained through the auspices of ACAS. Um, other than those exceptions, um, most uh, statutory, contractual and non-statutory claims arising from employment or termination can be validly waived in a settlement agreement. Um, the reason I said if compliant is that there are certain statutory requirements that a settlement agreement must meet in order to validly waive claims. Um, and these are that uh, the agreement firstly must be in writing. Uh, it must specify the particular claims uh, that an employee is being asked to give, um, to, to waive, to give up. Uh, it can't just say you waive all and any claims arising out of your employment. Um, and for those of you relatively familiar with settlement agreements, that's why there's usually this a uh, very long list of statutory claims that the employees asked to confirm they're giving up. It's because you, you have to be specific as to the claims that are being waived in order for the waiver to be valid. Um, the next requirement is that the employer must have um, advice from a relevant independent advisor. And that advice has to cover uh, the terms and effect of the agreement in particular, its effect on the employee's ability to pursue claims in an employment tribunal once the agreement is signed. So in essence, they need to be advised of the consequences of accepting the settlement payment and other arrangements in the agreement in return for waiving their potential claims. Um, relevant independent advisor has a specific meaning um, when it applies to settlement agreements. Um, and in practice, it will be a qualified solicitor or either a trade union representative or um, legal advice center worker who has received the appropriate training and has been given certification uh, to advise on a settlement agreements as an independent advisor. Um, whichever of those three categories of relevant, relevant independent advisor provides the advice, they have to have in place appropriate indemnity insurance covering the advice they give the employee. Um, and finally, the agreement must state that it meets the statutory conditions governing settlement agreements. So again, for those of you a bit more familiar with agreements, if you've ever wondered why there's a quite chunky, dense paragraph of text saying something like this agreement complies with uh, the terms regulating settlement agreements under section 203 of the Employment Rights Act, and, and then there's a huge list of lots of other statutory uh, instruments and, and statutes that contain similar provisions, that's why it's in there. It, it has to be, that paragraph has to be in the settlement agreement saying 
we are meeting the statutory requirements, otherwise it's not a binding agreement. So um, turning to clauses to include in the agreement, obviously there's going to be quite a wide uh, variety of um, styles even and types of clauses that you include. I'm just going to cover a few of the key ones and I've tried to group them by, by theme if you like. So um, what are the main clauses you want your agreement to contain? Well, first and foremost, as the employer, you're going to want to show you're getting value for money for the settlement payments you're making and the other arrangements you're putting in place. So you're going to want to ensure as far as possible that once the employee receives their settlement payment, there's no chance that they're going to be able to pursue any further claims. Uh, the main way to address that will be the clause that sets out and waives all of the relevant claims. Um, but in addition to the waiver clause, it is common to include um, various categories of what you might call belt and braces drafting to reinforce those waivers. So common examples might include uh, warranties that the employee, uh, or sort of warranties from the employee that the agreement does actually ad address and list all of the claims that apply to them. So uh, essentially that's a promise from the employee to you that you've not missed anything from your big list of claims that you asked them to give up. Um, you might also commonly include warranties that they won't pursue claims in an employment tribunal once the agreement's been signed. Um, or if um, proceedings have actually been issued, you will want to include a mechanism where the employee writes to the, the, to the tribunal seeking uh, withdrawal of the claim and uh, agreement that the claim is dismissed. Um, you may also want a warranty from the employee um, that they've not accepted or been offered new employment. Now that last one um, will be particularly important when you're paying a settlement sum that has been based on a presumption of a certain period of loss of income um, by the employee as the result of the termination of employment. So in more contentious situations where a claim has been threatened, um, it's probably less important perhaps not um, appropriate at all in circumstances, for instance, where your settlement agreement is the result of a voluntary severance package where the value of the exit package is based on a pre-agreed uh, figure based on some kind of uh, calculation that the university set out. So it's all, always um, worth thinking about the circumstances in which certain warranties may or may not be appropriate. And then once you've dealt with the key exit terms, you probably going to want to address some practical points around termination arrangements. Um, these might include asking whether you want to put the employee on garden leave for all or part of their notice period, um, or uh, whether you require them to carry out any specific handover, or indeed whether the circumstances merit an immediate termination of employment and a payment in lieu of all or the balance of their notice period. Um, and whether you're uh, asking the employee to work their notice or putting them on golden leave or terminating and paying in lieu of notice, um, you will want to think about what, what handover process is appropriate um, and whether there's a need to address a return of university property. Um, sitting alongside that uh, property issue is the question of keeping or returning confidential information. Um, and both of those points can sometimes be a bit more involved in the context of academic staff as it may be appropriate to have a general obligation to return property and confidential information, but in some cases you might need some specific carve outs around access to research materials or uh, publication of, of academic, um, ac academic documents. So it won't be appropriate in all cases. It's a very fact specific consideration, but sometimes a simple um, return of property and abide by confidentiality clause may be more simple than you actually need. Um, one other point to bear in mind is if there's going to be any kind of uh, substantial period between the date the agreement is signed with the, with the initial waiver and the date that the employee actually leaves employment, um, you may well be advised to have a two-stage settlement agreement with a, a reaffirmation letter on or around the date of termination. And the reason for that is to ensure that you are um, uh, uh, obtaining a waiver, an appropriate waiver, of any claims that might have arisen between the date they first signed the agreement and then the date that they've uh, left employment. Um, and the reason for that is, although there's no case law on this, um, it's generally thought that it's going to be difficult to validly waive uh, a cause of action that arises after the date that an agreement has been entered into. Um, so reaffirmation certificates in, in the right circumstances. Um, 
And then uh, there'll be the issue of uh, confidentiality of the settlement terms themselves, of the existence of the agreement, and uh, how you deal with matters affecting the parties' respective reputations. Um, those may include confidentiality restrictions, um, often uh, but not always mutual, um, also agreements not to make derogatory statements about each other, again, often but not always mutual. Um, and in the employee's case, there may be a need to consider an agreed reference, sometimes even, usually in the case of more senior academic employees, um, some kind of agreed announcement about uh, their, their departure. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about confidentiality when I get to um, the next slide and talk about practical tips. Um, next uh, clause that, that would you, um, as usual, want to address uh, would be something dealing with the employee's advisor's fees. Um, it's common practice to make a contribution to employees' legal fees where the relevant independent advisor is a solicitor. There is no actual legal obligation to do that. Um, the commercial principle underlying uh, the practice is that the employer benefits from the employee receiving the relevant independent advice. Indeed, the employee can't validly waive their statutory claims without that independent advice. So it's in the employer's interest for them to obtain it, and therefore the practice has grown up around um, making a contribution to fees. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that um, it's, it's not unusual for employees to um, who are negotiating, uh, negotiating a settlement agreement to have previously been instructing solicitors to advise them on their legal rights and potential claims against the university. And then when the settlement agreement negotiation begins, they may seek to try to get those fees paid as well. And generally, I would seek to, um, to not accept um, the, those kinds of fees being paid by the university because they aren't for the purpose of advising the employee on the settlement agreement. Um, they, they were um, in the employee's own interest to advise on their legal rights. And as a matter of principle, why should the university be funding those? Um, so if we turn to the next slide, please. I've set out here um, some various, I've called them practical tips. Some of them are uh, specific to the world of higher education. Um, some of them are, are just uh, more general points. Um, so in no particular order, um, when I say consider the open position, um, often um, you'll reach an agreement in principle to enter into a settlement agreement, but there may be at the same time um, letters of claims from solicitors, um, grievances that have not yet been addressed, an ongoing disciplinary procedure, for instance, um, an appeal against a grievance or disciplinary outcome. And it's important in terms of uh, timing to bear in mind that um, you don't want a protracted without prejudice negotiation about the terms of the settlement agreement to cause undue delay in your efforts to deal with the other things that are going on, um, as, as that could, um, in the worst case scenario, lead to a situation where the settlement agreement negotiations break down and the university has failed at an appropriate time to address one of those issues. Um, it's also important when thinking about open positions to bear in mind the proximity of any limitation dates, particularly where there might be discrimination issues where the act of discrimination will have happened some time previously, even though the employment is still going on. Um, now, the employee may have arguments about ongoing course of events, but they may not. And um, you may have a situation that uh, both parties really want to avoid where the employee is forced to issue proceedings in the employment tribunal to avoid uh, losing their potential claims on a time limit basis. Um, and of course, once proceedings are issued, those, those matters and the disposal of them, including withdrawal and dismissal, are matters that become public records. So there's uh, a PR aspect to it as well. So bear in mind the potential um, limitation dates by the employee while you're negotiating the settlement agreement. And then uh, the next point, um, NDAs, confidentiality and reputation. Um, for a long time, it's been standard practice to include confidentiality restrictions in settlement agreements. Um, however, as I'm sure you'll be aware, in recent years, there's been uh, quite a high degree of public concern about the misuse of what tend to be called NDAs when um, reported on um, by the press or discussed in government, um, but the use of confidentiality restrictions in settlement agreements in an inappropriate way, so as to prevent employees coming forward about wrongdoing within their employer and allow the employer to continue with that wrongdoing. 
Um, so as a result of those concerns, um, both ACAS and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission have produced uh, guidance on the use of such clauses in settlement agreements. Uh, the, the ACAS guidance in particular is, is well worth uh, looking over for the, the practical implications of, of what you'll be doing in, in a university context. Um, the ACAS guidance does acknowledge that in some circumstances, confidentiality obligations may be appropriate in settlement agreements. And that's particularly the case where the employee agrees that they should be included and where there's a shared interest in protecting reputations. However, the guidance makes the point that specific thought should be given as to why a confidentiality obligation should be required, and it should not be a simple default option that is automatically included. Um, the other key points from the ACAS guidance are that the, uh, the use of settlements um, should not prevent essentially valid and appropriate channels of reporting wrongdoing. So uh, it, sh it shouldn't be used to prevent uh, reporting of discrimination or harassment at work um, from reporting a crime or going to the police. Um, this was already in existence as a matter of law, but it, it shouldn't prevent making a protected disclosure, so whistleblowing. Um, and uh, also it shouldn't prevent an employee from going to the regulator. So for instance, there should be nothing and, and it should be explicitly carved out in settlement agreement confidentiality clauses that the restriction wouldn't prevent an employee from making a report to the Office for Students, for instance. Um, also, um, more specific to universities, you, you may be aware uh, that the government has invited universities to join a pledge not to use NDAs in sexual uh, harassment cases, and that so far five universities have actually signed up to uh, that pledge. And that Reinforce, reinforces the general position and guidance from ACAS and the EHRC on the inappropriateness of non-disclosure restrictions um, in a harassment situation. Um, I did have a few other points to make about uh, reputation generally, but I see we've only got 10 minutes left and I do wanna leave time to answer your questions. So I'm gonna skip over those. And if we have time in the q and I'll come back to them. Um, so turning to payments to senior staff, you may be aware it's nearly four years old now that the um, Council of University Chairs published a remuneration code in 2018 uh, and that provides in relation to senior staff that severance payments made to them must be uh, reasonable and justifiable. This came in the wake of a lot of publicity about um, significant payments out at vice chancellor level by a number of universities as I'm sure many of you will be aware. Um, the code says that such payments should be based on contractual and statutory entitlements and that government bod governing bodies need to explain the reason behind any payment with their decisions being informed by appropriate legal advice where necessary. Uh, the code was followed by the OFS's uh, accounts direction uh, which says that universities are required to have regard to the code and sets out various disclosure requirements into severance payments. So those include uh, the total amounts of any payments for compensation for loss of office paid across the whole institution and uh, the number of people to whom uh, such payments were made and any compensation for loss of office specifically paid to a VC, including any benefits uh, agreed on termination uh, with a VC. Um, I've made a, a, I've included a bullet point about justifying voluntary severance schemes in creating a paper trail. The main point to bear in mind about that is that as a receipt of public funds, um, it's important to make sure you have properly recorded that the university's remuneration committee has considered the use of public funds where you are using them for voluntary severance purposes and that the committee has uh, satisfied itself that those payments are a proper use of such funds and you have good records to that effect. Um, and my final point, three things to say about advisor certificates, and these are kind of things to avoid, really. Um, tempting though it might be, don't ask the independent advisor to confirm that the statutory requirements are met or that the employee's only claims are those in the agreement. Get those warranties from the employee, but it's not appropriate to seek them from the advisor. You could end up creating a potential conflict of interest for the advisor that um, paradoxically interferes with the independence of their advice. So it's, it's not in your interest to ask them to, get, to, to give those kinds of warranties. Definitely don't ask the independent advisor to be a party to the agreement. All they should be doing is certifying that they have given the necessary statutory advice. Um, and uh, you, you'll end up with um, a slightly counterproductive situation if you ask for those kinds of things, and also a slightly drawn out uh, negotiation. So um, 
those are those are things to avoid. So uh, we've got we've got a, um, seven minutes left, um, and we can uh, have a look at any questions that you've included. I see we've had a few. I think Katie's answered some of them in the chat already, but I think we've still got quite a few in the Q and A. Katie's asked most of them actually. Oh, brilliant! Um, have you <laughs> most of them? Katie, Would I don't you... know if you want to sort of give a couple and your answer to them. Uh, yes, of course. Um, so we had a few questions at the beginning. Um, so one was, do we have to say that this is a protected conversation? Um, there's no requirement to, but I think as Jane mentioned, um, it's preferable to do that um, so that everybody is clear on why you're having the discussion and what it means in practice, i.e. that it's not to be referred to later. Um, I think the terminology can sometimes be confusing. Um, so I mentioned that there is the pre-termination negotiations and protected conversations, which are the same thing. And then there are separately um, without prejudice discussions. So my view would be that it's helpful to say what it is and probably to explain what it means as well. Um, Another question was about um, having a protected conversation without the employee being accompanied, if basically all you're doing is putting the offer forward and not requiring the employee to respond to it um, there and then. So making sure that they have the time to consider and take advice. Um, and my view on that was that they're entitled to time to consider and to take advice on it anyway. And the code still suggests that they can be accompanied. Um, my view is it's quite low risk if somebody isn't accompanied and the risk is really around any allegations of improper behavior. Um, I don't know if Jane or Bob have a, a different view on that. Um, I, I think in practice, people often aren't accompanied and I've not known any kind of significant issue? I, I would say, Katie, that yes, <clears throat> usually, my, my experience is usually that first meeting, they're not accompanied, provided there is no improper behaviour. You might have a note taker present um, in relation to that. Um, yeah, it's the improper behaviour, the undue influence issue that can be an issue, but it, in practice, it doesn't tend to be. If you're just putting an offer to someone, then send them away to consider and say you'll have a further meeting in 10 days or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions we had was, does an employee have to agree explicitly that it's a protected conversation or can the employer simply state that it is? I said it, it either is or it isn't. It's not a question of the employee having to agree that it is. Um, but practically speaking, if, if they don't agree, that would be a red flag, I think, for me, um, because it sort of suggests that perhaps they're in that litigious mindset, um, <laughs> Bob's cat, uh, likely to want to refer to it later. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I, I, I agree with that, Katie, but I, I think you might need to be a slightly more careful when it comes to a without prejudice discussion though. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, to avoid that Mezzotero and Parabas kind of situation. You don't want to say without prejudice, are you willing to talk about leaving the university, for instance, it's get, get the agreement that there's going to be a without prejudice discussion mm -hmm. first and then you can you can get into the details of what you want to say. Yeah. Uh, have we got another question? I think there was one about having a protected conversation with somebody you were taking down an ill health. Um, you've been off sick for a long period of time. You were taking down an ill health capability um, yeah. route. Could you have a protected conversation there? And I'm gonna say, yes, you can, but there is a risk um, because if someone is uh, dismissed for ill health, they're likely to bring an unfair dismissal claim, but also possibly a disability discrimination claim. So it wouldn't probably wouldn't be able to be referred to in relation to ordinary unfair dismissal, but it might be able to be referred to um, in a disability discrimination claim. And as Katie said, that could just cause all kinds of problems in practice. But employment tribunal panels have to sort of ignore it for one type of claim and they can take it into account for another type of claim. And they are used to doing those kind of things, but it might result in um, a settlement anyway. Um, so it, you might think that it's worth the risk uh, to have that protected conversation. Yeah. 
think we might have some more questions. Um, can an employee have a rep slash TU rep for such conversations? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I don't know if the code specifically says trade union rep. Um, I can have a look, but I think there is certainly that right to be accompanied. So I think it's probably fair to say that that is a colleague or trade union rep. Yeah, I think it's the same as the, the standard. Yeah. yeah. Um, question about note taking. Jane says, if you have a note taker, who are the notes provided to? Is it all parties present? You could agree that you will if you have a note taker present and that might um, give the um, employee some comfort. I mean, I, re I really think it's, it's a note for your, your purposes in case it's challenged in due course. I agree with that. And I'd, I'd actually be a little cautious about providing an employee with the note. The purpose of the note is to show that there wasn't any unambiguous impropriety or um, breach of the, the, the ACAS uh, procedure for protected conversations. Um, and uh, if, you, if you do provide it to the employee, there can be that risk of then getting into an argument about dotting I's and crossing T's and what specifically was said that might be best avoided. So it's a judgment call in each case, but there might be reasons not to do it as well. I think we've got one more question. Uh, so might the organisation want to protect themselves from the employee discussing the details of the initial protected conversation with colleagues before any agreement is signed? So I think Bob, you, you were talking about um, future future claims, I think, weren't you? But um, often the settlement agreement will say something along the lines of um, the employee, well, I suppose it can say either, but it will sometimes say the employee will not um, disclose the fact and content of the agreement. And sometimes it will say as well that the employee has not done so. Yes. Um, um, but but it's also, um, I think, valid and, and, you know, depending on the circumstances can be appropriate to say, this is a confidential discussion, you know, you, you are instructed not to share uh, the facts or details of these discussions with anyone whilst they are ongoing. Um, and um, if an employee ignored those instructions, that might be that might be something to be dealt with as a disciplinary issue. So I think that would be perfectly appropriate for you to do.